Welcome to the Root the RPG movie. Our story today centers on three, maybe four, very specific vagabonds living in a tumultuous time in the woodland. Sit back, don't turn off your phone if you are watching on it, and enjoy the show. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the presidential D&D campaign, where AI-voiced presidents play Dungeons & Dragons with me, Ben Shapiro, your Dungeon Master. This is another movie where we are showcasing a different tabletop role-playing game than Dungeons & Dragons 5e, though. Today we are playing Root the RPG, a game of woodland adventure. I'm excited to try this one out, Ben. I was reading over the rules, and it looks like a fun break from Dungeons & Dragons, and more simple than Call of Cthulhu was. Yeah, I think this will be a fun system to try out. Root the RPG is based on a system called Powered by the Apocalypse, meaning it is a 2D6 system, which is one of my favorite things about this particular RPG. All you need are some six-sided dice and you can play. And you need the move list. I gotta say, this seems kind of strange, Ben. I'm not sure if Joe over here will be able to remember all of these moves. Shut up, Donald, I got this down, Pat. There's, you know, the different moves and then you do the one things, which means you win. Yeah. Well, that was kind of close, Joe. Don't worry, guys, we can get into the rules and how it works in a little bit. But first, let's introduce our characters. Barack, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure, Ben. So I'm playing as a Portuguese water dog named Bo, which, if anyone remembers, was my dog when I was in office. Sadly, Bo died back in 2021, but I thought this would be a good time to remember him, and I think he would have liked the woodland, at least in our talks about it, Ben. Bo has been a vagabond for a year or two now, ever since the Marquisat took over his home of Evershade. I'll be using the Adventurer Playbook, which means that I am a diplomat of sorts, making allies and trying to topple greater powers by forging strong bonds with other people. I was sad to hear about Bo. He seemed like a good boy. All right, I'm playing as Don Lionald, a lion scoundrel who has been a vagabond for a long time. I don't even remember the clearing that I'm from, but I've been to nearly all of them now looking for my family. As far as I can tell, I am the only lion in the woodland, though. I'm using the Scoundrel Playbook, which means that I am lucky and dangerous, creating chaos and destruction for its own sake. At least that's what the rule book says. In actuality, I am just the most powerful creature in the whole woodland. So, typically, I think it is suggested that you play with creatures smaller than a wolf, but I thought that the lion fit you pretty well. All right, Joe, what are you playing as? I'm playing as Joven, not to be confused with Joden. Joven is Joe combined with Raven, and as such, he is a Raven. Cunning intellect, amazing capabilities, and a sharp mind, just like me in real life. I was part of the Airy dynasty, but I fell out of grace with them when I went against orders and didn't attack a Marquisat caravan, mostly because they were transporting some locals as well, and I didn't want to risk them getting caught in the crossfire. I am playing from the Ronin rulebook, so I am a skilled and willful vagabond who now wants everyone to be free to do their own things. Awesome, thanks for introducing your characters, guys. I'm pretty excited to get started, but first, just a quick overview of the world of Root. This RPG is based off of Root the board game, and then Magpie Games turned it into a tabletop RPG as well. Our adventure takes place in the woodland, a vast land, largely uncharted and brimming with history. Deep in the forest, ruins lie dormant, forgotten by time, and few dare to travel off of the established paths or out of the clearings. Except for the vagabonds, outcasts of society who make their livings by helping, stealing, protecting, and harassing the Airy dynasty, the Marquise de Cat, or the local honest folks who make up most of the clearings. The Airy dynasty have been the rulers for a long time, though in a moment of weakness and rebellion, the Marquise de Cat came from outside the forest with industry and power, quickly claiming a foothold. Whereas the Airy dynasty is steeped in tradition and in maintaining the status quo, the Marquisat are totally fine with anyone and everyone working in their new factories, even if they have to force you to be there through threat of starvation. Tired of being caught in the middle, there is even rumors of a third faction, the Woodland Alliance, the common folk rising up against the ruling class, proclaiming freedom to all in the woodland. Though usually they just burn down the factories of the Marquisat or destroy the roosts of the Airy, leaving clearings a mess without order and rules. I like that there are factions that we get to deal with. We haven't really had that in the D&D &D campaign yet. Yeah, I like that they are all kind of good and kind of bad, too. Means that whoever we help isn't really the good guys, but might be the better guys for a particular clearing. Just saying, I don't see the problem with the Marquisat. That's called capitalism. It's the greatest system in the world. I don't know, kind of seems like slavery with the Marquisat, though. Anyways, our adventure will start in the small, secluded clearing of Willow Bend, a key clearing in the advance of the Marquisat, and one that the Airy Dynasty has been desperately trying to maintain control over. For the day-to-day -day life of the inhabitants, though, things are pretty much just the same. 
Farmers are harvesting their crops before the cold and fast approaching winter. Business mice head home from another long day at the office and groundhogs hawk their wares at the local marketplace. The three of you, a traveling group of vagabonds, have wandered to Willow Bend in search of a job and something to do. And with any luck, there is usually something that someone would hire a vagabond for. Where are you all and what are your characters doing? I'll be at the marketplace. That seems like a good place to find a job. And who knows, maybe there's something there that catches my eye. I'll also be at the marketplace, but I want to set up my own stall and make some bank. I've definitely gathered a lot of things over the course of my travels, and it'd be nice to make a couple of coins for them. Is there a local inn or anything like that? I feel like that's another place we might be able to find a job, too. All right, Bo. It seems like you would like to find out more of what is going on here, so I'll have you make a talent on the Pulse special move. You'll roll 2d6 and add your cunning score to try to see what information you can glean from watching the goings-on at the market. Similar to Call of Cthulhu, if you get below a 7, it's a fail. If you get a 7 through a 9, it's a success, potentially with a downside. And if you get a 10 or above, it is a hard success. I can already tell I'm going to hate how rigged this is. This is a good start, though. That's a 12 for me, so it says I get to ask three of these questions. You already told us who holds power in the clearing, so I think I want to ask what opportunities exist for enterprising vagabonds? Who is the local dissident? And what do the denizens hope for? You are able to hear about three different potential jobs for you guys. The Airy Dynasty is looking to move a shipment out of Willow Bend because they fear an impending attack by the Marquisat, a shipment which would make an easy target for three vagabonds such as yourselves. There is a local farmer by the name of Beekeeper Bumble, a porcupine, and who is also identified as the local dissident, who has been speaking out against the Airy Dynasty and is trying to start up a local chapter of the Woodland Alliance. The Airy Dynasty would pay handsomely if he changed his tune. And finally, You've heard that the Marquisat is looking for an informant, someone who has been in Willow Bend and could observe the Irie soldiers. They would pay for information, even if it isn't the most accurate. All right, Joven, as you walk in, you can tell that the barkeep, a short, stern-looking squirrel who isn't fidgeting like most squirrels do, would be the one to ask for any tips on where to head in town. You don't have any special moves for that, but do you want to roll charm for figuring someone out? Sure. That's an 11. Hey, Barkeep, any chance you've heard about any jobs in town? My friends and I are looking to make some coin. You guys are rolling really well. All right, he looks you up and down, immediately identifying you as a vagabond. Yeah, all right. Commandant Stormwing is in town. He could use some help for foiling an impending attack from the Marquisat. I'd recommend talking to him, up at the roost. Thanks. Finally, Don, a raccoon, comes up, looking a bit nervously and enviously at a particularly fine diamond that you found in a ruin not too long ago. How much for the... for the diamond you have there? What's the currency in this game? The Woodland runs on a barter system mostly, but the Airy do have Talon Coins, Winged Sovereigns, and Royal Plumes, called Talons, Wings, and Royals, which are similar to Copper, Silver, and Gold in D&D. &D. The Marquisate also have a similar system, but the names for those are Bargain Bits, Market Medallions, and Trader Marks, colloquially known as Bits, Medals, and Marks. A clearing only accepts currencies of whoever is in charge. Five Royals and it's yours. All right, Roll Charm for Persuade an NPC. I rolled an 11, but I have a plus two in charm, so that's a 13 then. Dang, you guys really are just rolling crazy good right now. He hurriedly reaches into his pocket and pulled out five royals, putting them on the counter before hurrying away. So in route, we don't really keep track of money, so I'll let you add another depletion box. That's the box that you would check if you were using an item of some sort. He turns away, then nervously turns back. You know, there is a ruin that I found when I was a kid. I bet there are all manner of treasures there. I could show you where it is if you wanted to maybe split some of the stuff you find with me. That sounds good for the box. All right, yeah, I'd be interested in that. Where is the ruin located? He pulls out a tattered, hand-drawn map where you see Willow Bend and the neighboring clearing of Juniper Ridge. It's just out here. If you leave the path about halfway to Juniper Ridge, it's maybe a day's journey into the forest from there. Thanks, I'll let you know if we head out there. I'll pack up my stand and head over to Bo. I'll head back too. This is interesting. We have a lot of little quests we can go do, guys. Yeah, we could rob the caravan, explore the ruins, inform the Marquisade of what's happening here, help the Airy repel the Marquisade, or either establish or crush the Woodland Alliance. Obviously, we should either rob the caravan or explore the ruins. I was part of the Airy for a while. I would probably know about guards and such, make it a bit easier to slip in and slip out after stealing whatever the caravan is transporting. I don't know. That seems like kind of a bad thing to do. We are Vagabond's bow, travelers in the great Woodland realm. We are our own masters, and there are none which can oppose us if we stand united together. We are... Shut up, Don. All right, fine, we can go rob the caravan if Joven actually knows about the guards and stuff. 
That would give us an advantage. Plus, one of my character drives is performing an illicit criminal action while maintaining a veneer of innocence. I guess breaking the law is a part of this game. Yeah, because this is a game of woodland might and right, and in this world, might makes right. All right, Ben, do I actually know about the guards? I'll have you roll cunning to read a tense situation. I think that would probably be the closest to it. Damn, this isn't good, guys. I got a two. You do remember the guard layout. There should be two ravens flying overhead, an eagle driving the cart, and three woodland animals guarding the rear. Your best bet would probably be to steal the cart, knocking the bruiser off of his seat and taking his spot. None of that is true, is it, Ben? It is as far as Joven can remember. I'll relay that to Bo and Don. All right, so all we need to do is swing in and knock him off the seat. We got this, guys. Damn, this is going to go terribly. You spend the afternoon getting to know Willow Bend a bit more. You see Beekeeper Bumble proclaiming at the top of his lungs that the age of birds is at an end. The time of the woodland animals has come. You also see a couple of Marquis 8 cats hiding in the forest, clearly planning something. Don, you see the raccoon who bought the diamond from you heading out into the forest with two other creatures you recognize as vagabonds heading in the general direction of the ruins. But you three are focused on something else. A group of airy guards leaving the bank on an armored wagon heading off on the path towards Juniper Ridge. Just as Joven had said, you see three woodland animals, particularly two mice and a squirrel, two ravens that are flying overhead, perching on branches along the way, and a particularly beefy eagle in the driver's seat. The carriage is pulled by a handful of armadillos, some of the only non-anthropomorphic animals in the forest. What do you mean by that? Also, does this mean that that raccoon is going to explore the ruin before we are able to get there? And that something bad is going to happen in Willow Bend since we didn't help the Airy, the Woodland Alliance, or the Marquisate? They don't talk or have human characteristics. In this case, they are more like oxen pulling a cart. And yes, there is at least a chance that you won't be able to do the other tasks now that you have settled on this one. Damn, I didn't realize that would be the case. That's kind of cool, though. Means that our actions will actually have a big impact on the world. So, Ben, what you're saying about the armadillos is that it's not slavery, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Armadillos are some of the more common ways to pull carts between clearings, especially popular among the airy since their thick hide helps to protect against Marquis 8 weapons. You follow the cart a ways out of town, taking to the forest to hide you from their gaze. How do you want to go about enacting your plan? Well, I have this create to destroy special action thing to help me rig up a dangerous device using available materials. Could I create something that could actually just knock the eagle off of the driver's seat? Sure, you can do that. Does it say what you need to roll for that? Finesse! Unfortunately, I do have a zero there, so here's hoping that my dice aren't rigged. Damn it, they are rigged. That's a four. All right, working quickly, you are able to fashion up most of a large tree branch that, if timed correctly, could smash into the eagle and knock him off, and then you could hop into his seat if you all move fast enough. But as you are making it, you realize that you really need a longer section of rope. Do you want to mark off a box of depletion to provide that rope? Sure, I'll mark off that extra box I got from selling the diamond. Luckily enough, you had bought some extra rope while you were in town. You are able to pull out the rope and finish assembling your makeshift battering ram to knock the eagle out. Do you want to roll for cunning to drop it at the right time? And who is going to be the one running up to get in his seat? I'll need them to roll a roguish feats acrobatics check. If none of you have that feat, one of you will have to trust fate instead. I have the acrobatics trait. All right, if this works, I am going to run in and say that I saw what happened and want to help them get out of there. I'm an experienced cart driver. Okay, that sounds good. Don, your finesse roll first. That's a seven. You let go of the log just a bit too late and it smashes into the side of the cart. It still does knock the eagle off the edge of the cart, but also the cart is heavily damaged now. It might not make it too far. All right, Bo, it's your turn to try to make it to the driver's seat now. That's a 10. Ooh, that was close. All right, I wanna dive out there and jump in the driver's seat, yelling out that I need to help them get out of here because it's an ambush but I want to take the cart off the road and try to lose the other guards in the forest. All right, let's roll this back a little bit then. Joven, what do you want your character to be doing during this? Well, if the plan is to go off the path, then I want to be working on clearing out a rough path for him to go on, removing any big logs or boulders or anything that might be in his way. All right, I'll have you roll for wreck something then. You'll roll for might to try to move those things out of the way. Sweet, I have a plus two for might. That's an 11. Thankfully, Bo is able to pull off the path at exactly the right time and follow Joven's recently cleared path. Racing away, you quickly lose the woodland animals, but the ravens are following close overhead. I want to fly up and fight them up there. I think I can fly, right? I am a raven too, after all. Yeah, you can do that. All right, as Joven flies overhead, Bo, you hear rustling coming from behind you. As you turn around, you see two badgers coming out of the damaged cart. Apparently, they had placed guards inside the wagon as well. 
God damn it, Joven. All right, I want to sharply steer the cart and pull the armadillos to a stop before jumping out ready for combat with these guys. Don, are you close? I'm assuming I am, right, Ben? Yeah, since you aren't afraid to travel off the paths, you were able to catch up quickly. All right, time for some combat then. Combat en route. The RPG is kind of similar to Call of Cthulhu, where it has a bit less structure than D&D 5th edition. So there are a couple of moves you can always do. You can engage in melee, which is typically rolling with might to try to deal some damage. You can try to grapple someone, which is basically getting into a wrestling match. And you can target someone vulnerable, but you need to be a bit farther away to do that. Finally, there are weapon moves, which you can do if you have a weapon that can do it. There's a lot of those, but I think each of you only have one each and a weapon that can do it. Contrary to D&D &D and Call of Cthulhu, though, I don't actually take turns. Instead, as you all interact with your opponents, I'll get to do some stuff accordingly. Mainly, and this is taken straight from the Root rulebook, a fight is more of a fictional description than a mechanical game. All right, I know that was a rather short explanation, but let's just try it out and see how things go. Who wants to go first? Me, obviously. Yeah, I figured you would want to go first. Sure, you go ahead, Don. All right, Ben, I want to run up and attack one of the badgers with my lion folk spear. That sounds like engage with melee then. So you'd roll with might and then see what happens from there. I have this better lucky than good move, which lets me mark exhaustion to roll with luck instead. Okay, yeah, you can do that here. That's a nine. All right, so since you got a hit, you have a couple of options. You can take less damage, do more damage, or try to hurt his morale and get him to run away. More damage, obviously. Yeah, that's what I thought. You run up and slash with your sword across his back as the badger clambers out of the broken wagon. He takes a heavy blow, tearing his armor to shreds, but does also hit you back, dealing one point of damage. I believe you have some chainmail, so you will mark wear on that item instead of taking damage. That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to wreck this guy. This is an interesting combat. All right, is it okay if I go next, Joven? Yeah, that works for me. I'll dash over to the other badger, the one that Don didn't attack. I want to subdue him quickly, but non-lethally. I'm going to be claiming this was self-defense afterwards. Since I have subduing strikes, that means I get to engage with cunning instead of might. But I don't get to inflict serious harm. So I'll run up and hit him with the hilt of my sword. That's an 11. That's a strong hit, so you get to choose three things instead of one. I'll take less damage and try to frighten him. I don't think there's really a third that I can do since I can't do extra damage, so just those two then. The badger watches in abject terror as you move swiftly and strike him in the face with the hilt of your short sword. He tries to slash you back, but moves slower since he is afraid, and you are able to deftly dodge his attack. All right, Joven, you're up. So I'm fighting with two ravens up in the air, right? What are they equipped with? They both have short bows, aiming to provide supporting fire for the caravan down below. I'll fire with my crossbow at one of them, trying to clip his wing and bring him down to the ground. That sounds like you're targeting someone, so you'll roll for finesse for that one. That's a nine. Damn, I don't think you guys have missed a roll yet. All right, for a hit with target someone, you inflict one damage by default. Your crossbow also deals an additional damage if it is absorbed by armor, but the raven isn't wearing any armor. You clip one of their wings and he comes crashing down, sharply hitting tree branches and falling with a thud, at the very least knocked unconscious. The other raven is going to use this opportunity to shoot a volley of arrows down at the wagon, forcing Bo and Don to either take an injury or take cover. Does taking cover mean we lose our next turn? Yeah, but you won't take any hits from it. I'll take cover then. Do the badgers have to take cover too? The one Don hit dives for cover back inside the wagon. The other badger is actually going to run off into the forest, deciding that his life is worth more than just another job for the airy. If I decide to take an arrow but then go after the other badger, would I get advantage or anything like that? There's no advantage that I'm aware of in route, but he wouldn't be able to attack you back. All right, that's what I'm doing then. The volley of arrows thuds down onto the wagon as the badger dives inside the cart and Bo dives under the wagon. The arrows glance off of the natural armor of the armadillos, and Don stands there steadfastly, taking an arrow to the shoulder that glances off of his chainmail. You will need to mark another wear on your chainmail, though, Don. No problem. I still have one more wear box on that. And I'm rich. I can always get another one. All right, is it back to my turn then? Yeah, you're up now. Would him having dove for cover make him more vulnerable? I want to viciously strike if I see an opening where his armor is out of the way or just where I think I could get him pretty good. There is a good opening where you sliced his armor open, and that is exposed at the moment. You'd have to mark two exhaustion if you wanted to roll with luck, though, because Vicious Strike also has you mark exhaustion. Worth it. This guy is so dead. Damn it, that's a six. This is rigged. Finally a miss. You trip as you are entering the wagon, sprawling flat inside. You do notice a rather timid-looking cat sitting in chains at the back of the wagon as well. The badger isn't going to be able to attack you since he dove for cover, though. All right, Bo, you spent your turn under cover as well, so Joven, you're up. 
I want to target the other raven then, once again trying to hit his wing and send him to the ground. Dang it, that's a six for me too. As you aim with your crossbow, a sudden gust of wind picks up and throws off your aim. The raven shoots an arrow back at you. Your leather armor is able to stop the blow, but you do fall back to the forest floor. You'll need to mark one of the wear boxes on your armor. All right, Don, your turn again. I want to viciously strike him again, but that is my last exhaustion box. Is that bad? That means that if someone forces you to mark exhaustion again before you have time to rest, you'll be knocked unconscious. All right, in that case, I just want to scramble to my feet and slash as quickly as I can, so that's engage with melee. But I will mark my last box of exhaustion to use luck instead of might. That's an 11, so I want to inflict extra harm, take less, and try to frighten him as well. He calls out with a scream as you descend on him, sword in hand, plunging it into his chest. He falls backwards, dead before he hit the ground. There is just the one raven left then, as Don emerges from the wagon. There is also the captive cat in the wagon too. I don't think I really have a way to combat the bird up above, so I think I'll just keep taking cover under the wagon, I guess. Yeah, neither you nor Don have any good ways of dealing with the last bird. That advantage is actually one of the main reasons the Airy were able to rise to power. All right, Joven, your turn now. Now that I'm on the ground, I'll try to shoot at him again. That's an eight. He sees the flying arrow, but isn't able to respond in time, and you pierce through his wing. With a loud screech, he crashes into a tree, hitting many branches as he falls fast to the forest floor. All right, that's the end of combat then. I want to interrogate the cat. I'm guessing he is part of the Marquis. Also, what treasure do we find in the wagon? There's actually no treasure, just the cat and chains. He looks up as you enter the wagon again. Hello, any chance I can convince you to let me out of here? First things first, who are you? Name's Shrubbers. You're kidding, right? That's a stupid name. What's your name? Don Lionel the Magnificent. And you're calling my name stupid? Shut your damn mouth. Are you one of the Marquis? If I said I was, would you let me go? Probably not, though I actually don't have anything against the Marquisat. Why are you in prison? The Airy aren't a big fan of cats. Understandably, you guys are the worst. I'm not with the Marquisat, not anymore at least. My parents were part of the first Marquisate cats to ever step foot in the woodland. They were the scouts who went back and told the Marquis of the natural resources that were present here. They left me behind, probably on accident, but they never came back for me. Wait, Ben, is George joining the party for real? Maybe he is. Yeah, we'll see. Anyways, I have just kind of been traveling between the different clearings looking for work, but everyone thinks that I am still one of the Marquisat. I made the mistake of going to Willow Bend and they thought that I was a spy who was trying to help the Marquis take over the clearing, so they took me captive. Say we believe you. What are you going to do if we free you? Well, it's clear that I'm not welcome in non marquisate controlled clearings. And I also hate the Marquis, so it's kind of a toss up. Why don't you come with us? If you're a vagabond, then people just kind of ignore you for the most part, usually hoping that you'll just leave them alone, unless they need help with something. Well, if you don't mind me coming along, I mind. But, yeah, if you can make yourself useful, then you can come along, I guess. Sorry, it's nothing personal, I just also don't like the Marquisat. They took over my home. Where's your home? It was Evershade, up to the northeast. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it wasn't great. Anyways, should we head back to Willow Bend then and see if we can still find another job? We didn't get any money from this one. Yeah, because Ben tricked us. I didn't trick you. I said the Airy were moving a shipment to Juniper Ridge. Never said it was money or anything. But you knew that we thought it was money that they were keeping out of Marquis Eight hands. A trick by omission. All right, maybe a little trick. Anyways, you can go back to Willow Bend. Shrubbers might not be the most welcome there, though. Yeah, I'd prefer not to go there again, at least not while Commandant Stormwing is in town. He is paranoid, that one. Yeah, I've heard about him, too. I have a good rapport with people in authority, though. I could probably get him to look the other way, especially if we help him out with either stopping the impending Marquisate invasion or with squashing the Woodland Alliance. All right. If you think you can convince him not to arrest Shrubbers again, then I think we might as well go and talk to him. I don't know. Joven doesn't seem in great standing with the Airy. Speaking of that, actually, I'll need all of you to mark another negative reputation box with the Airy. You did ambush and rob a caravan after all. If you hadn't left the guards or let the other badger escape, you probably could have blamed it on the Marquisat. And Bo, you'll advance for maintaining a veneer of innocence during that whole thing. I don't know if you really did, but I'll allow it. You can gain plus one to a stat, a new move, some new feats or skills, stuff like that. Oh, cool. I think I'll gain the fast friends move. About the caravan, though? Damn, I didn't think about that. We probably shouldn't go back to Willow Bend then. Not if they would recognize us now. I think it'd be a great idea to head up to Cedarvale. 
The Marquisat is in charge there, but we'd have to head all the way over to Ironwood in order to reach a clearing that isn't ruled by either the Airy or the Marquisate. I think we should just head to another Airy clearing. Maybe we should just continue on the path towards Juniper Ridge. They probably wouldn't know us there or be able to recognize us if they did, at least for a bit. We could also lay low for a while, right, Ben? I mean, give it a couple of weeks and the Airy would move on to bigger problems than just us. You could find a new home base in the woods to lay low for a bit. There's like 10 major clearings in the woodland, though. If they'd only recognize us in Willow Bend, let's just head somewhere else. I agree, but it could be risky if Stormwind goes somewhere other than Willow Bend. Then again, Ben, could we just change up our outfits? Joven and Shrubbers could both switch up their outfits and blend in, but there aren't a lot of dogs and absolutely no other lions in the woodland. You'd be recognized on the spot, probably. All right, if we are insistent on going to an airy clearing, I'm okay with heading down to Juniper Ridge. There's probably some work for us over there. We might need to convince the area I'm not with the Marquis, though. Sounds good. Maybe we can do some work for the Woodland Alliance there to try to gain some reputation with them. I'm not a fan of the area ever since they kicked me out. Bo isn't a fan of the Marquisat. Might as well try to help the people we don't actively hate. I think we should just do whatever is best for us. I'll need some more armor sometime soon. Ben, how do we recover exhaustion? So the best way to recover exhaustion is traveling along the path. If you travel slow and relaxing, you each recover three boxes of exhaustion, but collectively, you have to make two boxes of depletion. That does mean that I'll make a roll, and you'll have minus one to the roll for making it there. Also, if you're traveling on the path, then you'd have to go to Willow Bend, Juniper Ridge, or Greenbrier. Juniper Ridge it is. Let's take it slow so that I can get these exhaustion boxes back. Also, Shrubbers, what class are you? I'm an exile. I was part of a noble Marquisat family, but then once they left me behind, I left the Marquis to do my own thing. Of course, hanging around the Marquis is a safe option for me since the airy hate cats, so I haven't ever gone too far away from them. All right, so what happens when we are traveling to Juniper Ridge, Ben? Let's see. That's a three with your minus one. All right, so first off, you guys can clear three exhaustion boxes, but you collectively need to mark off two depletion boxes. Who wants to give up a depletion for the crew? I'll do it. Me too. Ain't nobody going to say that I'm not a selfless and caring player in this campaign. All right, so as you meander down the path towards Juniper Ridge, you round a bend to come face to face with an airy patrol. Apparently, word reached Juniper Ridge that something happened to the caravan. Halt, you there. Have you seen a caravan heading towards the ridge? The leader, a gruff and large eagle, makes eye contact with shrubbers. Wait a minute. You're a mark, aren't you? The airy quickly brandish their weapons. No, I'm not. I'll step in front and say, Shrubbers here is actually a spy against the Marquisat. He provided valuable information to Commandant Stormwing back in Willow Bend, information that helped to repel an imminent Marquis invasion. That sounds like you're trying to trick an NPC then. You'll need to roll with cunning. Damn, sorry guys, I tried. That's a six. The rest of the squad pull out spears or bows, training them closely on you. Commandant Stormwing sent word that they still had no information on the Marquis invasion. I think you're just a bunch of spies. You're under arrest by order of General Steelclaw. Submit, or we will take you by force to face the Feather Tribunal. Damn it. I should have rolled instead of you, Bo. I would have done far better. All right, well, are we fighting then? How many are there, Ben? There is the Eagle, two Ravens, two Sparrows, and three Owls. There's no way we can take all of them. Yeah, I've seen patrols like this. We could maybe try to run. They won't follow us into the deep wood. But all of us would have to make it away. Odds are at least some of us are going to be caught. Do any of you have the acrobatics roguish feet? I think that's the one it would be if we run away. I have that one. Not me. Not me either. I think we should run, though. Even if one or two of us get caught, it would be a lot easier to rescue just them than to try to break out all of us. Yeah, I'm running. All right, let's try to run then. This is going to go poorly. As you all try to run, I'll have you all roll for acrobatics then, as you jump over fallen trees and through the thick forest, trying to get as far away as possible. That's a seven for me. If we don't have the feet, then we have to trust fate and roll with luck then? That's right. I got an eight. I got an eight as well. Damn, that worked really well, guys. I got a 12. The four of you dash through the forest, and the airy guards are a bit too stunned that you are able to lose them quickly. Everyone other than Bo need to either mark exhaustion or have a risk come to bear. That sounds bad. I'll mark exhaustion. This stinks. I'm already back up to two exhaustion. Yeah, risk coming to bear sounds pretty bad. I'll mark exhaustion, too. I'll mark one, too, but also, Ben, my nature says that I get to clear my exhaustion track when I try to flee from a dangerous or overwhelming situation. Would that trigger here? Yeah, I think that should apply here. I think that would probably technically apply before you had to take the exhaustion, but I think it makes sense for that to rejuvenate you since that is your inner nature. Some of you exhausted from the run, 
You finally make it into a clearing in the woods. I gotta say, I did not expect you to make it away from them. At least not all of you. Well done, though. Yeah, that was really lucky on our part. I'm not quite sure if we should still head to Juniper Ridge, but I think we've already come too far. I just get the feeling that we are going to keep getting accosted by airy forces if we have shrubbers with us. Welcome to my world. We could still head up to Greenbrier. Last I heard, the Marquisat owned that. I'm all for that, then. As far as I can tell, the Marquise is just an honest business cat. There's probably some good-paying jobs up there. Ben, do we know anything about Greenbrier? Greenbrier used to be a pleasant enough little clearing. A guild of foxes made some of the best weapons in the woodland there, and the reclusive goats make horn wine, which is banned under both Marquise and Airy control, but, well, everyone still drinks it, so both empires have allowed the illicit trade to grow and flourish. I said it used to be a pleasant enough little clearing because the foxes mill broke and flooded the town. The resulting stagnant water rotted a lot of the buildings, and the insects really took over. It was under airy control beforehand, but they just left once it all happened, and then the Marquis stepped in. None of you have been there recently, so you don't quite know what it has been like under Marquisette control. I bet it's all fixed up now. The capitalistic cats would have cleaned up the water and made it all functioning well again. I doubt it. The Marquisat are rather terrible at improving anything. Amen to that, Shrubbers. All right, I hate the Marquisat, but they at least won't attack me on sight. To Greenbrier, then. Sounds good to me. Hopefully they don't attack me. I used to be part of the area after all. Damn, for Christ's sake. We literally have some of everyone in this group, don't we? Yeah, except for the Woodland Alliance, I guess. The trip to Greenbrier passes uneventfully. You spend two nights in the forest on the way there, and while the road between a Marquisat and Airy clearing is closely watched, Few patrols are seen, and since it is unknown which faction you belong to, nobody disturbs you. You know you arrived in Greenbrier first because of the smell, a stagnant and brackish scent. Deep pools of standing water with insects buzzing around litter the landscape. You see a couple of hedgehogs sweeping large nets over them, gathering up the insects to sell at the local marketplace. Then you hear the factory, a hulking behemoth of a factory built right on top of the old and defunct sawmill. Thick black smoke churns out the top and you can hear saws and hammers coming from inside. A stream of mice, foxes, and squirrels are getting off of work for the day, shoulders slumped, heading back into Greenbrier proper. Told you the mark was at wouldn't help. This is even worse than I thought it would be. Yeah, this is why capitalism shouldn't be allowed to run freely. Obviously, these are socialist marquees. Anyways, maybe the people are happy. Do they look happy to you? Shut up. All right, let's look for some work, yeah? There's always work for a vagabond, right? As you head into town, the thick smog from the factory hangs low in the trees, obscuring the view to houses up above. You see most of the animals heading towards a large, hollowed-out tree near the center of town. A couple of goats stand near the doors, drinking from bottles in large brown bags that are shaped like horns, and a tall, spindly squirrel is preaching about the dangers of horn wine, that the animals need to throw off the Marquis' overlords and join forces with the Woodland Alliance. You've never seen someone so blatantly proclaiming the Woodland Alliance before. Typically, they are especially reclusive to avoid the attention of the Airy or the Marquisate. I want to walk up to the squirrel. Hey, are you actually with the Woodland Alliance? I thought you guys were supposed to hide underground and stuff. What's your deal? That would be trying to figure someone out. You'll roll charm for that one. That's a nine. All right, so at any time during your conversation, you can ask one of these questions to try and figure out what his motives are if he is lying to you, stuff like that. He looks at you, sizing up the four of you and adjusting his jacket. Well, yes, of course I am with the Woodland Alliance, trying my darndest to get these folks to listen to me so that we can escape the tyranny of these sinful cats. Anything we can do to help? A look of surprise crosses his face, which transitions to a look of suspicion. I'll have you roll to persuade an NPC. Wow, that's a 12. You guys are on a roll again. His look of suspicion fades, replaced by a look of desperation. Yes, if you would be so willing, I could most definitely use some help. My name is Marlo Hatch, at your service. Last night, a couple of goats friendly to the cause were thrown into jail by that nasty Marquis Marshal. If you would be able to convince him to let them go, that would go a long ways in helping us get back on our feet. How are you able to talk about this so openly? Yeah, I also want to use my question to see if he is telling the truth about this one. Honestly, the Marquis just don't care anymore. The factory is up and running. As long as their numbers stay up, then they don't pay me any mind. Of course, I want to see the whole factory burn to the ground, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. I suspect that if the factory starts underperforming, I'll be one of the first ones to face the gallows. And that doesn't bother you? Not particularly. I believe in what I do. Also, Don, it does seem like he is telling the truth. He seems to really believe in the Woodland Alliance and believes that the Marquis would kill him if things start to gain any more traction. Although, looking closely in your observation, you can see that he is currently drunk as well, even though he was preaching about how horn wine is a terrible sin. 
Can't blame him for that. This town seems like it really sucks. I thought you said that a capitalistic hellscape would make a great town. No, I said a capitalistic paradise would make a great town. These marquees definitely don't run a good business here, and that's bad. All right. Any ideas on how we can get the goats out of jail? I have some good stats for trying to trick people in authority. I could try to convince him that the goats are actually marquee spies who are trying to infiltrate the Woodland Alliance. That's a really good idea, Joven, but I'm not sure how it would go after he lets them out unless they are leaving. They could leave. Would that really be so bad? Anyways, on another note, we could dispose of the marshal. The Marquisat would just appoint another one, probably even someone worse than the current one. Yeah, but it could help in the short term. But I think there's probably a better way. I think we should first try to see if there's anything we could do for the marshal that would convince him to let them go. It might be as simple as just stealing some horn wine for him. That sounds like a good plan. Let's go for that. Then if it fails, we can try my plan. I think if it fails, we should just go ahead and dispose of him. It'd be hard to convince him that they are Marquisat spies after we just tried to convince him to just let them go. You guys want to go find the marshal then? Yeah. Heading further into the swampy town, you see a small but packed jail carved into another one of the enormous trees. A large cat sits on a chair much too small for him, resting with his back feet kicked up onto a rickety desk. A mound of paperwork sits to the side, damp and moldy from the constant thick humidity caused by the flood. He looks up as you enter, sitting up straighter once he sees shrubbers walking in as well. Hello, Marshal Clawstone at your service. What are you lot doing here? We don't have another inspection for... Yeah, like a week or so. I can't find the paper, but I know it's not today, so you can't be angry. I don't have the paperwork lined up yet. Ben, do I know anything about what a Marquisat inspection would look like? Not all the details of it, but you do all know that both the Marquis and the Airy are big fans of the paperwork being in order and the numbers checking out. Well, see, Sheriff, we are here for the inspection, but perhaps we could come to an arrangement to get you a passing score. What arrangement are you thinking? Some friends of ours ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. A couple of young goats, I think you just arrested them just last night. If you let them go, then maybe we could fudge the inspection a little bit in your favor. He strokes his whiskers thoughtfully. Do you have the inspection papers? Um... Hey, Ben, I have this fancy paper move that lets me use counterfeit, and if I have an intimate knowledge of the faction's politics and procedures, I can mark notoriety with that faction to get a 12 automatically on the roll. Can I do that here? Yeah, you can do that. Cool. I'll reach into my pocket and produce the forged papers. As you can see here, all of the paperwork is in order. You know that you can't afford another failed inspection. The Marquis might just put you in one of these cells. Nice work, Shrubbers. Now I'm actually glad we brought you along. Thanks, I think. Marshal Clawstone's whiskers tremble slightly. Apologies, I didn't mean no offense, just wasn't expecting the inspection today. All right, I suppose I know the goats you're talking about. Gotta say, they are neck deep in the horn wine trade. Strange friends for a Marquisat patrol to be keeping. Yes, those would be strange friends for us to keep. He pulls out a key and heads off towards the cells in the back. A few moments later, he emerges again, leading two young goats with him. Are these your friends? Yeah, this is them. He pauses for a moment, then shrugs and unlocks their handcuffs, pushing the goats towards you. All right, then. We have a deal that I pass this inspection, then? Yeah, we have a deal. As we leave, I just gotta say, that worked out great, but I do surprisingly feel bad for a Marquis Sheriff. When that actual inspection happens, it is not going to go well. Yeah, he probably will end up in that prison. He kind of deserves it, though. Maybe. We don't actually know if he is bad, though. He kind of was just doing his job by arresting some Woodland Alliance people. Why would he not arrest Marlo, though? Obviously, he is the instigator, right? That's a good point. Can I ask the goats why they were arrested? They looked nervously at each other. Well, you know, we had some illicit liquids in our possession that we were transporting. The marshal caught us and threw us in here. Look, we would give it to you, but the marshal already confiscated it all. God damn it, are you both part of the Woodland Alliance? They break out laughing, Marlo's weird little cult thing? No, why would we join up with him? Yeah, Marlo just used us to break his horn wine dealer out of jail. How didn't I catch on to Marlo's lie with my question, Ben? You asked if he was telling the truth about his connections with the Woodland Alliance, not about his goat friends. Well, I guess we already got them out. Might as well take them over to Marlo, too. You lead the goats back over to Marlo, still standing outside the large, hollowed-out tree in the center of town. It's very busy now. All of the workers who had finished a day's labor at the factory are here. Marlo is sitting on a bench, looking more worse for wear than he was when you saw him just a little bit ago. He perks up almost immediately upon seeing you returning with the goats, though. My new friends, you did it. I must say, I am impressed. Perhaps the Woodland Alliance can really have a foothold here in Greenbrier now. I want to talk further. But before we do, is it okay if I talk to my two goat friends alone first? 
Just some business to hammer out before we can begin planning our newfound rebellion. Cut the shit, Marlo. We know these guys are just your horn wine dealers. His face scrunches up, turning a bright shade of red. What? No, I don't indulge in that sinful substance. Horn wine is nothing more than a distraction concocted up by the Airy or the Marquis to tie us down into bondage. I detest the stuff. I think we should leave it alone, Don. Obviously, he is addicted to it, but also we need him if we actually want to help out the Woodland Alliance. If we want to help them at all, I guess. We could still just do our own thing. I think we should help them. This place isn't doing well under the Marquis, and the area are what caused this town to be flooded in the first place, I think at least. I thought it was the Fox's Mill that broke. Yeah, but that happened under Airy control. Fine, we can help out the Alliance, but if it comes down to us getting rich or them taking over, I say we get rich. That's the law of the forest. Maybe your forest. All right, we'll leave Marlow and the goats alone for a minute to conduct their deal. As you step away, you see Marlow and the goats having quite the heated exchange. Apparently, he is not happy that the goats no longer have his horn wine since the marshal confiscated it. Eventually, he storms back towards you guys, and the goats slip into the large tree. My apologies, I do have a short temper nowadays, and my acolytes aren't exactly the stars that I would like them to be. Now, are you lot serious about helping the Woodland Alliance set up shop here in Greenbrier? Mushroom's mercy, we could certainly use it. Yeah, we're here to help, for real. All right. Well, if you truly want to help, then I think our next step would be breaking into the Marquis' storage facility near the factory. They keep weapons and explosives there. If we could blow up the factory, well, there'd be nothing keeping the Marquisat here in Greenbrier. Yeah, and I bet that's where they keep the confiscated horn wine too, right? He purses his lips, squirrel teeth showing prominently. Well, I suppose so. That is probably where they keep it. We could destroy all of it with the factory. That would also serve to weaken the Marquisate. All of their guards love the stuff, filthy creatures. All right, I guess we can help you. You're sure that there are weapons and explosives there too, right? This isn't just some sort of ruse to get your hands on the horn wine. Why in the name of the mighty oak would I ever want to get my hands on horn wine? I'm telling you, I've never touched the stuff. But yes, I'm sure of it. Last autumn, there was a bit of a, well, a riot, I guess. The Marquisat had shut down one of the goat horn wine refineries and the people weren't happy. It's probably the only thing they have ever done that I agreed with, though. Anyways, the guards all got lots of weapons and equipment from that storage shed. I'm sure there is enough in there to take the factory out of commission. All right, we are trusting you here, though, Marlo. Do you have a plan on how to break into the storage facility? Well, no. I never thought I would get this far, but you are vagabonds. You could probably break in there tonight if you wanted, right? Obviously we could. All right, are you coming with us then? I'm not much of a fighter, I'm afraid, but I'll be waiting nearby. As soon as you give the all clear, I'll be there. Yeah, I'm sure you will, just in time to snatch up as much horn wine as you can hide from us. All right, Ben, could we scout out the storage facility then? Sure, do any of you have the sneak roguish feet? I do, I'll go, this has my name written all over it. I have that one too. Too bad, Shrubbers, this one is all mine. All right, what do I roll for that, Ben? For roguish feats, you roll finesse. Told you I'm the best, that's an 11. You are able to find a good spot to observe the storage facility, and you see three guards outside the front of it, each with chain mail and swords. Definitely well armed for a simple storage facility. It's a small building in the shadow of the factory and has definitely seen better days. Do you see a way that we could get in? You could try to overpower the guards and get in that way. You also see a weak spot where the wall is beginning to crumble on the side. A small explosive could leave it wide open, but that would attract the guards as well. So we need to get the guards distracted somehow and blow a hole in the side. I don't fancy our chances of taking the three guards head on. I could easily take them out single-handedly. If we are already making an explosive, we might as well blow up the guards. Then there are fewer Marquisat we have to deal with at the end of this too. Oddly enough, I agree with Don on this one. I say we just blow up the guards. All right, do any of you have the capabilities to make an explosive? I'm guessing Don does. Of course I do, I'm a super genius and I'm just awesome. I'll use my create to destroy, move again to build a bomb, Ben. All right, roll with finesse then. That's only a five. This is so rigged that I don't have anything in finesse. I should have plus two to all my skills since I'm obviously the greatest. You assemble the entire bomb only to realize at the very end that you don't have an igniting agent. You would need to get some ember wood, blaze leaf, or foxfire resin in order to complete the bomb. Do we know where we could get any of those things? Considering the surrounding woodland is a swamp following the flood, foxfire resin would be your best bet. All three of those materials are strictly prohibited by the Marquisat, though, so it isn't something you could just buy at the marketplace. We could ask Marlo. He might know of somewhere we could get it. Yeah, he is probably our best bet. You find Marlo by accident on your way back to the center of town, seeing him at the end of an alleyway. As you approach, he glances over his shoulder and hurriedly stuffs a horn-shaped brown bag into his pocket. Oh, hello then. 
Did you find some way we could crush these infuriating Marquisate overlords? Marlo, we know you have horn wine in your pocket, but yes, we have a way. But we need an incendiary device, something like emberwood or foxfire resin. Do you know of anywhere we could get that? Marlo's face flushes with embarrassment as he pulls out the bottle of horn wine. I know what it looks like, but I confiscated this off of some young squirrels. I just couldn't bear them getting addicted to the stuff. He scratches his ear. Anyways, I know of a grove not terribly far away that has a fair amount of foxfire resin. It has a guardian though, Eldrith, and it is a, well, let's just say creepy place. And Eldrith is a strange one. He came to town once, first owl I've seen in a long time. Anyways, he claims foxfire resin is the key to intellect and gives him the ability to see the future. Doesn't really let anyone touch the stuff. Well, I guess it's a shot then. How do we get there? Marlow points off towards the east side of Greenbrier. Head into the forest, maybe an hour or so that way. You'll see the yellow flowers, and that's how you know you are in the right place. Can't miss them. They glow in the dark. All right, you better be right about this, Marlow. He nods vigorously. I know I am. My apologies, I would come with you, but there's, you know, some stuff I need to handle here to make sure that Greenbrier is ready for the revolution. It'll be chaos once we blow up the factory. Why do we need to deal with the warehouse at all? Can't we just use Don's explosive to blow up the factory? We'd probably need a lot more than just a single explosive, though. It's a really big factory. And more importantly, the weapons from the storage facility. I want a new weapon, or two, maybe six. Yeah, you would need a lot of Foxfire resin to make something big enough to damage the factory. Unless you had access to the design schematics and found a weak spot or something. That is definitely something you all can look into as well. First, we need to get the resin, though. Let's head to the clearing he mentioned, yeah? The trip through the forest is simple and easy going. Though there are hordes of mosquitoes that you have to fend off, you don't run into any animals or anything like that. It is pretty rare to run into true wildlife so close to a clearing. Bears and moose tend to stay far away from civilization, mostly because the clearings are just so noisy. As you get closer to the grove, you start seeing the glowing flowers that Marlowe had mentioned, and a thick mist begins to settle in. What the hell is up with you, swamps and mist, Ben? Literally everything we do always has a swamp and mist, every time. It's atmospheric, okay? It's played out as what it is. Fine. You actually leave the swamp and arrive in a now mistless grove. The light from the flowers makes it seem as though it is close to noon. The brightness of the flowers makes it so that you can't really see that far beyond the clearing, just enough to make out a large shape flying overhead. Who dares enter the grove of Eldrith, the wisest and mightiest of the forest? Just some vagabonds, Eldrith. We just need some foxfire resin. Brave adventurers seeking the forbidden resin of the grove Indeed, you must be foolish if you have traveled this far, for none can leave with the resin save they answer my riddle, and none have ever succeeded. A riddle? Okay, I got this, guys. Don't worry. Born in the woods, majestic and wise, I reign overnight with watchful eyes. Silent wings slice the moonlit sky, as I glide with grace, a sight to spy. My feathers gleam with silver glow, whispering secrets only I know. With a call, my presence is known. In twilight's embrace I am shown. What am I, keen observer, can you see? In the realm of night I truly be. Answer clear, and the prize you'll win. Unveiling the treasure hidden within. Okay, even Don isn't narcissistic enough to make a riddle for his grove that is literally just himself, right? Obviously the answer is an owl or Eldrith himself. Yeah, it's definitely just Eldrith. I beg to differ, Bo. I would absolutely make myself the answer to a riddle but obviously my riddle would be so much better than his. My riddle is too obvious, you say? Well then, the jest is on you, I am afraid, for in order to claim the treasure of the grove, you must answer two riddles. Yes, two riddles. Through the woods, I swiftly roam. In shadowy places, I find my home. I dance upon the moonlit glades, leaving no trace of my escapades. With fiery eyes, I gleam and glow. My whispers in the night do show. A cunning trickster, sly and smart, with a bushy tail I play my part. What am I, dear wanderer, can you tell? In the forest's secrets I do dwell. Answer me this with wit and grace, and claim the treasure within this place. All right, that one is a bit more difficult. Yeah, I could see a couple of things that could be a raccoon, maybe. I was thinking fox mainly because of sly and smart. It's got to be one of those two, though. I was thinking Fox, too, because of the fiery eyes one. But then again, I've seen some fiery raccoons. Let's go with Fox, I think. Worst case, we just kill Eldrith, right? Not a big deal. You hear a shrill laughing. Kill me. Do you not realize where you are? One match, one spark, and you will all go up in flames. 
do not dare to match wits with Eldrith the Majestic, but yes, you are correct again, it was a fox. Unfortunately, you must answer a third riddle as well, obviously, this is the law of the forest, and none have gotten this one before. All right, out with it, I'm sure we'll get it again. Through the twisted lands it flew, a purple cow, an ocean of blue, with feathers made of candy floss, and scales that sparkle like applesauce. It danced upon the marshmallow clouds, singing songs to the buzzing crowds. A riddle it posed, but no answer in sight, for it spoke in whispers of pure moonlight. What is the sound of a rainbow's laugh? Does the sun wear a polka dot scarf? In this realm of whimsy, no answers are found, just riddles that spin round and round. You made that up, right? Like, just now? Such a preposterous question by a lower intelligence. Of course, I had planned our meeting from the start. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that you would answer my first two riddles and fail on the third. I actually don't know this one, guys. Yeah, me neither. What was that about the sound of a rainbow's laugh? And if the sun wears a polka dot scarf, that doesn't even rhyme or anything. I don't have any ideas here. Maybe a unicorn? No, definitely not a unicorn. The riddle makes no sense. Isn't it obvious, guys? I bet it doesn't even have an answer. Eldrith definitely just made that up. You hear a slight hooting sound coming from above. Do you give up yet? Look, Eldrith, just give us the stupid resin. We answered your riddles, except for this one you just made up and doesn't have an answer. Interesting. I had not thought that you would solve that one. Yes, there is no answer. Well done. I had not anticipated meeting my match in wit and intellect, but the four of you have done a good job. Mostly me, I got all of them right. Joven definitely got that last one. We were stumped. I answered it, though. On accident. Anyways, Eldrith, can we have some resin, then? A shape flies down, perching on a tree branch not far above the forest floor. A large owl sits there, looking curiously down at you. I suppose I will let you have some of the resin. May I ask what you plan to use it for? Gaining knowledge, I suppose, is the obvious answer. But will you brew it, or dry it out and ingest it in... other ways? No, we are going to use it to blow up a marquee storage facility. His mouth drops. You what? Why would you waste such a precious resource on something so, so violent and inconsequential? This is the elixir of the gods. Yeah, well, we aren't really that interested in getting addicted to Foxfire resin. I am not addicted. That is preposterous. You are lucky that I am an owl of my word. Otherwise, I would not give you any resin at all if you are just going to waste it. He tosses down a vial of an amber liquid that looks like liquid fire. Be gone. I thought I had met my equal and could finally share in the discoveries of the universe. But alas, you are just as short-sighted as those foolish cats and birds squabbling over territory like children in a sandbox. Firefox resin as an explosive. So dull and wasteful. Well, we got what we came here for. Eldrith seems like one strange bird. You can say that again. All right, Ben, can I make the explosive then? Yes, but I will have you roll finesse again. Hell yeah, that's an 11. All right, so you need to choose if the device is more dangerous than intended, larger or more unwieldy than intended, or more temperamental and fragile than intended. More dangerous, obviously. Wait, what if that blows up all of the explosives in the facility too? Damn, I didn't think about that. If it's temperamental and fragile, then we are risking it blowing up in our hands as we carry it down to the guards, though. We'd have to have it larger or more unwieldy than intended, but then it is going to be more difficult taking it to the guards without them noticing us. Why did I still get a debuff, Ben? I rolled an 11. On a 10 plus, you get one of those. On a seven through nine, you'd get two. And if you roll below a seven, you'd have all three. Good thing you rolled well then. Yeah, I'm saving all of your asses for sure. All right, Ben, let's make it larger than I intended then. You finish your explosive, a large sphere about the size of an exercise ball. And you are near the storage facility too, though now there are only two guards outside. How do you guys want to do this? Are you up for another impersonation, Shrubbers? Maybe you and Don could take it down there with some paperwork and say that it is the newest transport for the storage facility? Direct orders from Marshal Clawstone or something like that? That's a pretty good idea. All right, let's do that then. Ben, I'll mark another notoriety with the Marquisat to counterfeit papers with a 12. That does move me down to a negative one reputation with the Marquisate, which isn't great, but does trigger an advancement as well for my infamy drive. Nice, all right. What do you want to do with that? I'll gain the I bring you move from my playbook. That one looks pretty good. This is stupid. I haven't hit either of my drives yet. I'm sure you and Joven will hit some with this task we are pulling off. I would say this is an illegal caper against impressive odds. At least the destroying the factory part. All right, shrubbers, let's go. You approach the guards, gently carrying the explosive down to them. They look up and add attention as you approach. Halt! 
Who goes there? We have a new explosive that we were told to bring to storage. See, the paperwork is all here and in order. The guard looks at the papers. We weren't notified of any shipments today. Marshal Clawstone confiscated this explosive from some vagabonds earlier. Didn't want to risk it laying unprotected at the jail, so he told us to bring it here. Roll for trick and NPC, Don. Damn, that's only a three. The two guards meet eyes and then look back at the two of you. Say, we haven't even seen you around these parts before. Is this some sort of prank or something? We have the paperwork right here. It's all in order. That's true. You do have the paperwork. All right, leave the bomb here. We'll take it inside, but no way are we risking some random hornhead getting their hands on all of our horn wine in there. Fair enough. I want to slightly activate the bomb, Ben. That'd be the sleight of hand roguish feet. Guess I'm trusting fate then. That's an eight. You're able to activate the bomb without catching the eye of the guard, but you realize too late that in your attempt to be secretive, you set the timer for only 15 seconds. If you don't both book it, you'll both get injured. But also running away that fast will definitely attract the attention of the guards. Damn, all right, I'm running for it though. Yeah, I guess I'll run for it too. As you both begin sprinting away, one of the guards reacts faster than the other and begins pulling the other guard away as fast as he can too, but not nearly fast enough as the bomb explodes, blowing a sizable chunk of the front of the storage shed off. The two guards are thrown probably about 20 feet away by the blast, not moving. Well, that worked pretty well, I guess. Yeah, not bad, guys. All right, let's get these explosives and weapons then. As you enter the storage facility, Marlo comes running up from the forest. Guys, you didn't tell me you were ready. Damn, it's a good thing I was already on my way to find you when I saw the explosion. Otherwise, you'd have to have done all of this without me. You've literally done nothing for us, Marlo. Nothing? I told you about the goats who are members of the Alliance and told you where to find the Foxfire resin, and I told you where the storage facility was. You wouldn't have been able to do any of this without me. God, Marlo, you're really getting on my nerves. You literally just provided us with a little bit of information that literally anyone could have. And those goats were definitely not members of the Woodland Alliance. All right, Don, that's enough. We all know that Marlo is just a hornwine addict, but he is our only connection with the Woodland Alliance. I don't give a shit about the Woodland Alliance. I'm doing this for me. And because these Marquisite cats are spitting on the good, honest name of capitalism. We know Don, but Marlo is an ally, even if he is pretty useless. Do we find what we were looking for in the storage facility, Ben? You find three different rooms, one full of weapons and armor, one full of explosives, and a third full of horn wine. As you enter the horn wine room, Marlo's jaw drops. This is more than I ever thought possible. How could they have gotten this much horn wine? I don't know, but we are destroying all of it, though. Yeah, yeah, I know. Or we could use it to our advantage. If we control access to this horn wine, I bet we could get all of the Marquis 8 guards to just listen to us, and then the town is ours without destroying the factory at all. Hell, for this much horn wine, I bet everyone would just sign up with the Woodland Alliance on the spot. That does actually seem like a more peaceful solution. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. But I don't think they would stay with the Woodland Alliance. And in a month or so, when all the horn wine here runs out, then we'll be right back where we started. Agreed. We still need to blow up the factory. True, but if we use the horn wine to get everyone on our side, we can then destroy the factory and make sure nobody would get hurt in the process. It's a win-win. If we just blow up the factory, then there is a chance that there are still animals inside. I'm still leaning towards just blowing it up. There's less that can go wrong, even if there are some casualties. It'll go a long ways towards freeing Greenbrier from these socialist bastards. Christ, Don, these are capitalists, not socialists. I think Bo's idea is a pretty good one, honestly. End result is the factory is destroyed and the Marquisite gone. That's what we are going for, right? Fine. But I am taking all of these explosives for when your plan inevitably goes wrong, Bo. That's a good backup plan for sure. All right, let's take this horn wine somewhere safe. We should probably send Marlo away, otherwise there won't be any of it left when we need to use it to blackmail everyone. Marlo, you should head back to town and keep your head low for when the Marquisat inevitably comes looking for this. Marlo scratches his ear. All right, yeah, I guess that does make sense. He looks a bit defeated like he couldn't find a legitimate reason to stay. You guys don't need help moving all this horn wine? We got it handled. He heads out the door, returning only a second later. Vagabonds, we have... Um, we have a problem. One of the guards is gone. Damn it! He must have been able to get just far enough away from the blast where it didn't kill him. This is bad. Reinforcements are probably on the way now. We can't stay here. All right, here's the plan. Let's grab all of the explosives we can carry, and then prime the rest of the explosives on a timer. We'll blow up the storage shed and all of the other weapons and horn wine and stuff and use that to make our escape as well. How many explosives can we all carry, Ben? 
I'll say that you could each carry two explosives of a similar size as what you used to blow a hole in the front of the storage shed. Also, as you say that, Marlo gasps and tries to mask a look of pain. Maybe we should take some of the horn wine and use that as the blackmail. We wouldn't need much. Marlo, we need you to carry explosives. If you care about the Woodland Alliance succeeding in Greenbrier at all, then we need to leave the horn wine and just take explosives instead. Let's have you roll charm to persuade an NPC. Damn, only a five. Marlo looks at you and then back at the horn wine. I'm sorry, I just think it's a better option. You'll have the eight explosives from you guys and then some horn wine from me to blackmail the people. Wait, Marlo, you said yourself that this stuff is terrible. Let's just help everyone break the addiction. You could help a lot of people be free from that sinful stuff, right? Isn't that your whole goal? Marlo scratches his ear with shaking hands. I just can't do it. We need the horn wine. We can't let it all just get blown up. I'm going to level my sword at Marlo. Marlo, grab some explosives or I will plunge this sword into your chest. A look of fear crosses his face as he backs up flat against the wall. I... I knew it. You are just a bunch of Marquisat spies, aren't you? You don't want the Woodland Alliance to succeed. Christ Don, put away the sword. Okay, Marlo, grab the horn wine if you want. But we need to destroy the factory to do the very thing that you have been working to accomplish. He relaxes a bit. I do think the horn wine will help us get some more people on our side, at least some of the Marquisate. He hurries into the other room and picks up a couple of jugs of the horn wine. You are each able to get a hold of two of the explosives as well, and you said you wanted to set the other explosives on a timer too? Yeah, that's my plan. How long are you setting the timer for? I don't know, five minutes? I think shorter than that. We don't want the Marquis to get here too fast and be able to disarm them. Maybe three minutes? Yeah, three minutes will be long enough for us to get away. As you set the timer for three minutes and head out the door, you see a large squadron of Marquisat cats led by Marshal Clawstone on their way down the slope to the storage facility, not more than 50 feet from the front of the building. They shout as they see you emerge. You there, halt by order of the Marquis Typhon the Great. You're under arrest. Wait, you're that Marquisate inspection officer. You're a fraud, a vagabond. Get them. The squadron begins sprinting after you, probably about a dozen or so cats. Shit, we should have left sooner, guys. Dadoi, obviously we should have left sooner. We got to get out of here fast, guys. The shed is going to explode really soon now. Yeah, I'm booking it as fast as I can, holding these explosives carefully. Marlo gets a little bit of a head start, running as fast as his squirrel legs will carry him while managing to keep a weak grip on his jugs of horn wine. Are all of you following behind him? Not me. I'm actually going to slowly be backing away, holding up one of the explosives. Careful now, if you come any closer, just one more step, and I'm going to set this thing off. You aren't going to be able to make it out of here alive. Interesting. Would you actually set the explosive off if they came closer? Well, no, probably not. I don't want to die, but I'm hoping they don't know that. I'll have you roll charm to trick an NPC then. Thank goodness, that's a nine. The cats are wary, only taking a step whenever you take one, maintaining the same distance away from the group. Marlo and the other three are able to get a good distance away from you since you are holding up the squadron. The marshal comes to the front. Look, let's resolve this peacefully. We don't want to die. You don't want to die. Just give us back the explosives that you and your friends took from us and we will let you all go. Nobody has to die today. How much longer until the bombs explode and how far have I made it away from the storage facility? It definitely has less than a minute. You have only made it about 100 feet, definitely still in the blast radius. You'd need to make it probably about 300 feet away to be in the clear where the trees, foliage, and distance would cover you from the blast. All right, I want to arm the explosives that I'm holding with a very short timer and throw them at the squadron before running away as fast as possible. Okay, I'll have you make two different checks for that. The first is sleight of hand and then acrobatics. Since I don't think you have the sleight of hand roguish feet, that one will be luck for trusting fate. That's a nine for sleight of hand. And a seven for acrobatics. Let's go. I truly am the greatest of all time. None of you can dispute that now. You all would be dead if it wasn't for me. You're welcome. All right, I'll say that those are good enough. You pretty much pull the pin on the explosives and throw them, and the squadron dives for cover as you dash away into the forest. You hear an explosion and then can hear them yelling and reorganizing before a second explosion rocks the forest floor. You are also able to make it back to the rest of the group. Marlo not even caring about his proclaimed aversion to horn wine as he takes a long gulp from one of the jugs. All right, I gotta give you props, Don. I know we don't always see eye to eye, but you do come in clutch most of the time. Yeah, that was good work. Unfortunately, that means we only have four explosives to try to take down the factory. I don't think we can take it down with just four of them. Damn it, before we get into that, I just realized we didn't grab new weapons, Ben. Can we retroactively grab some? You are each able to find a better version of whatever weapon you had, so you can clear all boxes of wear, and then it also gains the sharp tag, 
so you can mark wear on it to deal one extra point of injury to whatever you are attacking. Also, I'll say that you can all clear one box of depletion and any boxes of wear on armor that you have. Finally, too, I think that both Joven and Don would be able to advance with their drive to escape from certain death or incarceration. That was definitely one of the likely possibilities from that encounter. Hell yeah! All right, I'm going to gain the arsonist move from my playbook so that I can roll with luck when trying to destroy something using explosives or fire. Seems like that will come in handy with destroying the factory. I'll add plus one to my finesse. Seems like a good enough thing to do. Nice. All right, thanks, Ben. We've all advanced now, then. All right, how should we destroy the factory, then? Any ideas? We could try to scout it for a weak spot. It's built on top of the old Fox sawmill, right? Maybe the Marquisate cut some corners in building it, and there's some structural weaknesses. I was also thinking we could go back to Eldrith and convince him to give us some more of the Foxfire resin. We could make more explosives that way. How many do you guys think we will need? It's a really big factory. If we can't find any structural weaknesses, probably at least 10 or so, right? Yeah, that's about right. If you had 10 explosives, you could probably place them all at different spots and do a pretty good job destroying it. Or if you're able to find some weak spots, you would be able to do it with just the four that you currently have. Hey, I just had a thought. Marlo, why did Eldrith come to town all those years ago? Marlo looks up, having been quiet and looking sort of ashamed during the conversation so far. Well, he came looking for... All right, whatever. He came looking for horn wine. I saw him just outside the root cellar, which is a sort of underground bar located in that tree trunk near the middle of town. It didn't look that underground to me. Everyone was going there. It doubles as a restaurant, but if you order special drinks that aren't on the menu, then they bring you some horn wine in regular glasses. They don't do a very good job at hiding it, to be honest, but the Marquisat haven't raided it or anything. I guess they know that it is the only thing keeping people from rebelling against them. You know, I bet the Marquisat are on the payroll for the root cellar then. Maybe that's where they got all the horn wine from. They agree not to raid it in exchange for their own private supply. Yeah, I bet that is what is going on. Anyways, the rest of my thought, if I was right about that, is what if we exchange the horn wine for Foxfire resin with Eldrith? He might go for it and part with more of the resin than we would be able to get without violence. All right, I think that's a good idea. We should split up. I think it went really well last time, right? Two of us should go to Eldrith, and the other two should go scout the factory, searching for weak spots. It'd be better to plant ten explosives in weak spots and just absolutely decimate the factory if both of us are successful. And it means we don't have to waste time if one of the ideas fails. That seems good. Republicans and Democrats, then? I'll go with Bo to Eldrith, and the two of you can go scout the factory. Sure, whatever. If we run into any frog people, though, you guys better believe me this time. Funnily enough, frog people would be pretty normal in this world, though. Yeah, I guess so. All right, where do we want to go to first? I'm always first, so of course me. All right, Don and Shrubbers are going to be heading to the factory to scout for weak points. How do you guys want to go about doing that? I think one of the things we should do is probably go undercover as a worker, right, Don? Then we could scout from the inside without drawing attention to ourselves. I was thinking as Marquis at guards, actually. I'm a lion. I could probably disguise myself as a Marquis cat, and you actually are a Marquis. I'm assuming that the guard patrol that was chasing us died in the blast, and hopefully that was most of the Marquis in the town. Ben, how far is it to the nearest Marquisat controlled clearing? It's about a day or so. So that gives us two days to pull of this factory thing. A piece of cake, we need less than one if we can find these weaknesses. Maybe there are some uniforms for the cats up at the jail? All right, that sounds like a pretty good idea then. Heading up to the jail, you find it locked from the inside. You'd need a key, which is presumably on Marshal Clawstone's body somewhere near the storage shed, but it would be pretty difficult to find. Do you have the picklock feet shrubbers? No, you. No, maybe we try to break down the door or in a window or something? I have a plus one to might. I could give it a try. Ben, I'll ram the door with my shoulder trying to break it down. All right, roll with might then. That's a seven. You are able to crack open the door and shove it the rest of the way, but it makes a very loud sound. You see some passerbys looking over at you, but they seem to ignore you for now since you are cats breaking into the Marquisat jail. You probably just left your keys. Besides, they would have to come talk to the marshal in the jail to do anything about it. Inside, you see a couple of ruffians, a goat or two, a burly-looking squirrel, and a sleek fox all in the cells. The fox calls over, hey, where's our food? It's past breakfast. Do I look like the cook? Damn, though, I wonder if these guys are going to starve without the marshal around. I guess it's just probably two days or so until the Marquisat send reinforcements. That's assuming someone has already left to go get reinforcements. It could be a week or longer. What do you want to do then? Let them go? Maybe we just come back and feed them after we finish with the factory. 
Yeah, I guess that will only be tomorrow at the latest. All right, Ben, do we find any uniforms? You do find some Marquisat uniforms, so you'll be able to impersonate guards when you are at the factory. As you head towards the menacing factory, looming high into the sky above you, you arrive with the rest of the morning shift. Lines of workers with their shoulders slumped, shuffling their feet as they head into another day of work at the factory. Entering inside, you are waved over by one of the remaining Marquisat guards, one of the ones that would have been working at the factory when the others were pursuing you last night. Hey, you aren't Victor and Garrett. I thought they had the next shift. Oh yeah, they called in sick. It's up to us now. Oh yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Victor calls out sick every time he has been out at the root cellar way too late. I tell him every time that horn wine is for the weekend, right? But anyways, I don't want him to get fired or anything. Has that wife and kid at home? Yeah, I wouldn't want him to get fired or anything. As we walk away, we definitely killed Victor last night, right? Probably, but the past is in the past. Besides, Ben is just trying to make us feel guilty for blowing everyone up. It's their fault, though. If they just adopted capitalism instead of this socialist shit, then everyone would still be okay. Hell, the workers would love coming into work every day. Yeah, fair point. All right, how do we go about finding weak spots, Ben? Well, as you enter the main assembly hall, you see rows and rows of conveyor belts and worker animals all lined up, putting together weapons, farming equipment, some household supplies, pretty much everything a typical Marquisat factory puts out. You get a few death stares from some of the workers, but most of them are just too downtrodden and tired to give you a second look. You do see three large pillars holding up most of the room. Two explosives each would probably collapse the roof in this room. Heading into different parts of the factory, you find a couple of other prime locations that would be good for explosive too. The boiler room, an overhang leading into the loading dock, and another pillar in a room lined with cubicles. Mostly though, you are quite surprised at how many workers there are, and you get the feeling that there are always this many workers in the factory at all times. There's probably about 1,000 animals total in the building. So you're saying that we need to find a way to get everyone out of the building in order to blow it up? Otherwise, we are going to be causing a massive number of casualties. Pretty much, yeah. All right, you were able to gather the information you need, though, so we will jump over to Bo and Joven. You both make the trek back to Eldrith's Grove, once again seeing all of the luminescent yellow flowers. He doesn't seem to be hiding this time, just sitting up on a tree branch not far off the floor and looking quite glum and depressed. Hey, Eldrith, good to see you again. Looking over, he says, Yes, yes, good to see you too, I suppose. I have not come up with more riddles if that is why you have come. Apparently I am not as wise as I had presumed. You four imbeciles solve my riddles far too easily. I have obviously been lured into a false sense of superiority by the stupidity of most of the animals of Greenbrier, which has led to my vast intellect atrophying over time. Such a shame, I was one of the brightest of the bunch. Now I am just an old owl, well past his peak. Hey, don't beat yourself up. I thought your riddles were quite clever. Nice try. You don't have to flatter me. We're not. We are telling the truth. Besides, I bet you still have another riddle or two in that brain of yours. Well, yes, I suppose I do. You wouldn't want to hear it, though, I am guessing. Sure, let's have it. Amidst the shadows, I hold the key. A riddle I offer, answer it, and see. In the depths of night, my question lies, unveiling secrets before your eyes. I fly without wings, without a sound. In darkness I'm sought but rarely found. Silent whispers I bring to your ears, revealing truths that transcend your fears. I am the beginning, I am the end. A puzzle unending my message to send. What am I, seeker of truth and law? Crack this riddle and you'll find more. Hmm, that's a pretty good one. Crack this riddle and you'll find more. Maybe a container of some sort, like a nesting doll? That fits the last line, but not the others. I think it is something more abstract, unveiling secrets, darkness, silent whispers, and revealing truths. Those all sound like they are pointing more to an idea than an object. Maybe it is just an idea. That sounds good. An idea then, Eldrith? Huh? I have finally stumped you. Though I suppose an idea is pretty close. Maybe I am not quite as clever as I would have thought. The answer was wisdom. The epitome of existence. Alas, anyways, why have you come back to my grove? Back to take more Foxfire resin to blow more things up? Such a waste. <laughs> yes, we are here for Foxfire resin, but we actually brought you something in return. I believe you are familiar with horn wine. Would you be willing to trade for that? Eldrith's eyes light up and you see him lick his beak. Well, yes, I suppose that could be a worthwhile trade. I have not had horn wine in quite some time. It does dull the senses you see. 
But that is not a bad thing when you have as sharp a mind as mine, I suppose. Yes, perhaps not ingesting horn wine is why I have not been at the top of my game recently. How much did you bring? Damn, how much did we bring, Ben? How much did Marlowe take from the storage facility? He took four jugs of it and kept one to himself. So you could have up to three jugs to give to him, but that wouldn't leave you with any for bribes or anything later on. Maybe we just brought one jug then, Joven? That seems like a lot for one owl. Yeah, that sounds good. One whole jug, Eldrith, all to yourself. Let's have you roll for persuade an NPC. That was close. That's a seven. Very well. I shall give you half that amount of Foxfire resin then. Give me a moment. He flies up to the top of the tree before returning a moment later with a handful of the vials. All right, here you go. Now, if you give me the jug, then we can conclude this business transaction. I'll hand him the jug and take the vials. All right, back to Greenbrier then to meet up with the others. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Okay, you head back and meet up outside the root cellar, around the same time as Don and Shrubber's return from their task as well. I gotta say, that went a lot better than I thought it would. Me too, that wasn't too bad and nothing went wrong then. How many explosives can we make, Ben? You have enough vials to make six explosives, so you'd have ten total. And you still have two jugs of horn wine to use for bribery if you find the need. All right, time to blow up this factory then? I'm sure nothing is going to go wrong, right? Well, of course it is. We are starting to get towards the end of the movie, probably. Ben is about to screw us over, most likely. I would never. Right. You would never cause the end of the world right after we saved it, or pull a plot twist just as we are headed into the final battle. Not something you would do at all. What is it this time, Ben? Probably Shrubbers, right? He is secretly still working for the Marquisat and called in reinforcements. Or Marlow has secretly been actually working for the Airy this whole time. And so they are going to come ambush us as we try to blow up the factory? Stop metagaming Don. There's been nothing that has suggested something bad going on yet. And things are actually going pretty smoothly. Besides, I wouldn't mind one last fight too. We've only had the one so far. We've managed to escape or blow up any other potential fights. Yeah, I haven't gotten to fight at all yet. I'm always down for a fight, don't get me wrong. I am just saying that the shit is about to hit the fan. I'm sure of it. All right, well, we will have to see what happens. Are you heading to the factory then? Yeah, let's go. We still need to figure out how to get all of the workers to leave, though. I'm not blowing up a thousand people to destroy this factory. Definitely agreed. If we can't figure out how to get the people to leave, then the factory is going to have to stay. Let's get all the people out then. Is there a fire alarm or anything, Ben? Well, first, you need to figure out how to get everyone and the bombs inside the factory. There were only the two uniforms, so Jobin and Bo don't have one. And it will look quite suspicious if you just walk in with ten bombs in hand. Actually, I say that's exactly what we do. That'd clear the factory out for sure. Yeah, we just walk in with the bombs and tell everyone to get out. Not a bad idea, Shrubbers. Let's go for that then. Gotta say, I was not expecting that. All right, as you walk through the door carrying the explosives, all of the animals start running away, even the couple of Marcusat guards too. You are quickly left to the factory by yourselves. Yikes, that wasn't great. Still, now that we're alone, let's get these bombs planted and blow up this factory once and for all, yeah? Although now that I am thinking more about what we are doing, this seems like kind of a waste. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. Like, the factory isn't great, but it gives the people here a job, and it could be used for something better with a lot better working conditions too, right? Hold up, why didn't I think about that? Yeah, we could just set up a true capitalistic society here and have the people work for better pay. We could encourage and foster competition and have a productive factory. We could make bank off of owning it too. Wish we had thought of that before we just scared everyone out of the building. I was thinking we'd have more of a socialist economy and just give the factory to the people. Let them do with it what they want to so that they own the means of production. That's stupid, it would go poorly for sure. Either some of the workers would revolt and proclaim ownership, nobody works at all, or the factory just goes out of business. All right, guys, let's not have a debate on the merits of different economical systems. Things aren't good under the current Marcusat rule, so let's at least try out handing it off to the Woodland Alliance. We can even put Marlowe in charge and give him the choice of either running the factory or having the animals in the clearing own the means of production. Just leave it up to the people. All right, I can agree to that. We are vagabonds anyway, so I don't want to stay put in one place for forever. So you guys don't want to blow up the factory, but instead try to give it to Marlowe? What do you want to do about the Marquisat? Damn, we did kind of forget about that part, guys. The reinforcements will be here in just a couple of days, probably. Unless we convince them not to. Like, they can't actually be profiting that much off of Greenbrier. The only thing keeping them here is the factory. But if we say that we are going to blow it up unless they give us the clearing, then they don't really have any reason at all to stay. That's a good idea, Don. 
All right, so we need to get a message to the Marquisate and have Marlowe try to get some more of the Woodland Alliance here, or recruit more of the Greenbrier residents to rise to arms if need be. Greenbrier itself isn't worth much, but it is on a major path between Airy and Marquisate clearings. And we need to make sure that Marlowe is okay with making those decisions. I think he will be. He's just a strung out hornhead, but Don got the impression that he truly does care about the Woodland Alliance. Is Marlowe with us, Ben? Yeah, he is, standing timidly near the entrance, clutching tightly to the jug of horn wine that he kept. Marlowe, are you okay taking charge here or giving it away to the residents here? He rocks back and forth. I... I don't know. I don't... I don't think I'm ready for that. I never thought that we would get this far. You know, I hate the Marquisat and the Airy, but at least there was someone to blame for how terrible things are. If this fails, and it probably will, everyone is going to blame me and the Woodland Alliance. We'd never get another chance to do anything. People would just point to Greenbrier and say that it doesn't work. We'll hang around for a bit and help you get things running. Maybe even help drain the swamp. Marlo stops rocking back and forth, seeming to gain a bit more confidence. Okay, yeah, if you all are willing to help me, then I am willing to try to run this clearing better and make things better for everyone who lives here. I need a lot of help, though. And we will be here every step of the way. As you are about halfway through that sentence, Marlo lurches forward, falling down to his knees. The jug of horn wine he was holding drops to the ground, breaking open and spilling a green liquid across the floor. He coughs up some blood and falls face flat on the ground, and you see three blue feathered arrows protruding from his back. A squadron of airy birds come storming in the doors to the factory. God damn it, is Marlo dead, Ben? I was actually starting to like him, like sure, he was an addict and didn't help us with anything, but at least he wanted to try to do something to help the people here. Of course you say that now that he is dead, Don. How many birds are there in here now, Ben? A full squadron of perhaps 20 birds came through the front doors. You're in the main assembly hall, so it is a huge hall with a really tall ceiling. Well, we are still carrying these bombs, but we don't want them all to go off. We'd probably bring at least part of this place down with it and we'd die in the blast. So Ben, this seems like a pretty tense situation. Can I try to read what the best way forward would be? Sure, roll with cunning. That's an eight. You think that if you could throw just one bomb, if you were able to do it before the airy were able to fire arrows at you, then you all would be able to take cover and split up the fight. Maybe take it into some closer quarters where you would have a better chance of taking on so many long range fighters. Nice, okay, I wanna quickly arm and throw one bomb at the airy and then shout for everyone to get to cover. I think that sounds the most like targeting someone, so I'll have you roll finesse. Damn, that's only a six. You do get a plus one for acting on the tense situation roll too. Oh sweet, that's a seven then. You're able to throw the bomb and it explodes about halfway between the four of you and the airy birds. You are all able to either get to cover or make it into a different part of the factory. I want to head over to the cubicle area. I feel like that'll give me more cover and put me closer to any birds that follow me. I'll just take cover in the assembly hall, but I want to try to hide until at least some of the birds head off after other people. I'll head to the boiler room with my two explosives. I'm blowing at least part of this place up and I'll be able to fight in closer quarters. I'll head to the loading dock, I guess. That way we're splitting up all of the birds. Not sure if this was a good idea, though. All right, as you all start running away into different parts of the factory or just taking cover, you hear the bird commandant shout, after them, kill them all, except the Marquise's son. I'll say that five birds head after each of you then. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Also those shrubbers, are you the actual Marquise's son? I mean, yeah, I said I was a member of a royal family, but then got left behind, right? You didn't say it was the royal family though. How'd you actually get captured by the Airy then? And are you actually against the Marquisat then? I think that conversation will have to wait until the end of the combat. Don Lionel, you're up then. So there's five birds in the boiler room with me, Ben? Yeah. Momentarily after you arrive, the birds fly in after you. They aren't able to be more than five feet off the ground, so you'll be able to engage in melee with any of them. I want to quickly set the explosives down off to the side so that I can set them off once I finish killing these birds. And then I'll pull out my newly enhanced lion folk spear, and then I'll engage in melee with the first of the birds. Also, I think that this would count as diving into a dangerous situation without forethought or planning. So I should get one box of luck armor too because of my daredevil move. That makes sense. All right, roll with might then. Damn, that's only a five. The bird is able to fly just slightly out of the way before hitting you back and taking out that box of luck armor. Still got three more boxes on my chainmail. This is gonna be a tough fight, guys. Yeah, Ben is definitely trying to kill us. You shouldn't have taunted him so much with your metagaming, Don. Agreed, who wants to go next? I can go next, if that's okay with everyone else. I want to actually try to talk my way out of this. No way can I take five birds in close combat. Hey, look, 
Before you kill us, you should know that we are about to deal a major blow to the Marquisat. Let's have you roll to persuade an NPC. That's a nine. The birds hesitate just slightly. Let's say that we believe you. If you surrender and give up the Marquis cat, then we'll let you and your friends go. Damn, I can't do that. I'm sorry, he is a friend and an enemy of the Marquisat. All right, they're going to raise their weapons again. You will advance, though. I'll say that that was expressing your moral principles at great cost to yourself. Nice, all right, I'll take a plus one to Might so that I can hopefully be able to do a bit more in this combat. All right, Joven, you're up next. Now that those birds are gone, I'll try to line up a shot where I can hit two birds at the same time. That's a trick shot then. You'll have to mark where on your crossbow and roll with finesse. That's a 10. Nice. All right, you are able to dive and shoot your crossbow in the middle of your dive, lining up a perfect shot at two flying birds. The arrow pierces through the first one and buries itself in the chest of the second and both fall motionless to the ground. You can also choose to make a second attack or to distract the other birds. I'll distract the other one so that I don't get hit by anything. The second bird crashes into a console and turns on one of the conveyor belts. The other three birds all turn, thinking that you are somewhere near the conveyor belt on the other side. All right, Shrubbers, you're up now. All right, I want to mark where on my quarterstaff to hit the bird from further away so that I am inflicting harm instead of trading it. Then I'll swing at the first bird to come into the loading dock. Roll with might for engaging in melee. That's a seven. You smash your quarterstaff onto the head of the first bird and it crashes into the ground. It is dead as well. Maybe this won't be as bad as I was thinking it would be. There's still five birds on both of us though, Bo. That's true, all right, your turn then, Don. I'm gonna mark exhaustion this time to attack with luck instead of might. And I'll also mark wear on the weapon to attack from range like Shrubbers did. That's an 11 as I stab at the bird again. All right, you aren't going to trade harm with that bird. However, one of the other ones is going to shoot an arrow at you, glancing off your chainmail. You impale the first bird with your spear, landing a direct hit on his heart. You also can choose to either inflict morale harm on two of the other birds, or I'll let you attack another one instead. I'll inflict the morale harm on two of them. Does that make them start running away? Not quite yet. You'd need to deal one more morale harm each. All right, Bo, you're up next. I'll arm and throw my other bomb, I think. All right, that'll be targeting someone. Dang, that was close. That's another seven. All right, you throw the bomb as one of the birds loses an arrow, dealing one point of harm to you. The bomb explodes, vaporizing one of the birds and harming the others. Well, that's something at least. All right, my turn then. I want to try another trick shot to hit two of them at the same time again. I feel like if they are all investigating the conveyor belt, then I could probably line up a good shot. Yeah, I'll say that you can do that again. You'll have to mark another wear on your crossbow. Hell yeah, that's an 11. Damn, I thought this would have been a lot more difficult. That does impale two more of the birds, though, and both of them fall dead. The last bird is the Commandant, so he actually is wearing more armor. Well, I'll deal with him next. Can I make another attack still since I got above a 10? Yeah, you can target him now, too. That's a 10 for targeting, then. All right. Since it's a sharp crossbow, you are able to actually impale and wreck his armor, which is now effectively useless. Not sure how that could happen with a single crossbow bolt, but that's how much damage you did. He is going to fire a crossbow bolt back at you, dealing two points of damage to your armor. Nice work, Joven. Yeah, that was awesome. All right, my turn then, Ben. Yeah, your turn now. I'll mark another box of where to attack another one of the birds with range. All right, roll with might again then. That's a nine. Holy hell, I feel like you guys are just lying about these dice rolls. All right, you are able to pierce and kill another one of the birds. So there are only three left now, they are going to fire two arrows at you in return, which I think you ignore one of because of your plate armor, but the other will inflict one point of wear on it. Still got three more. I know. All right, th then back to Don again. I'll mark another box of wear on my spear to stab one of the birds I didn't frighten with the first attack, and my final box of exhaustion to attack with luck instead of might. I truly am. The all-time greatest in all of the world. That's a 13. All right, you viciously eviscerate one of the other birds. I'm guessing you also want to put morale harm on the same two birds as last time, too? Yep. Terrified of this ferocious lion that they are fighting in close combat, two of the remaining three birds take flight and run away. The final bird is going to shoot another arrow at you, dealing one damage before dropping his bow and pulling out a spear like yours. So that leaves one bird with Don, four with Bo, three with George, and one with Joven. Bo, it's your turn next. All right, I'll move up to be attacking with my sword. I want to subdue these guys quickly and non-lethally, though, so that I can roll with cunning instead of might. Sorry, Ben, that's a 10. It's okay. I've made my peace that I can't kill you guys in combat, apparently, unless it's an unplanned random encounter. With that, I want to suffer less damage and inflict some morale harm as well. You smash the hilt of your sword into the face of one of the birds at the same time as you dodge a blow from him. 
he is knocked unconscious, and the savagery and speed of your attack caused another one to fall backwards in fright before running away altogether. The last two birds are both going to shoot arrows at you, dealing two points of injury. That's it for my armor, so I do take one point of actual injury, too. Well, at least I did something. All right, Joven, it's your turn. I'll just shoot at the last guy normally. No tricks or anything. Damn, that's only a six. He sees you taking aim and ducks behind a large machine just in time, dodging your attack before swinging back around and firing a crossbow back at you. You'll take two more points of damage on your armor. It only has one point left. Do I take an injury then? No, it specifically just deals extra damage to armor. Your armor is done for though. All right, still got four health though. All right, for my turn, I want to attack another one. I'll mark my last box of wear on my item too. Hell yeah, that's a 12. I wish I was surprised. All right, so you get to deal more damage, take less, and inflict morale harm onto one of the birds, too. Nice, I'll do all of that then. All right, you do take one point of damage on your armor from the remaining two birds, one of whom is about to run away. You smash your quarterstaff onto the bird's beak, which collapses with a sickening crunch. Back to me then? Yeah, back to you. I want to attack the last guy. Unfortunately, I don't have any exhaustion boxes left, so I have to attack with might instead. Damn, that was a four. The bird you move to attack slashes you with his spear, dealing two points of damage. My armor only has one box left, so that means I also take one injury then? Yeah, that's right. All right, Bo, you're up next. All right, I'll move to subdue one of the remaining two birds. Damn, that's a five. You stumble and one of the birds trips you to the ground and then they both kick you. You'll take two points of injury. Damn, I'm down to one box left, guys. I need some help once you guys finish with your people. I'll be on my way soon, Bo. I'll target the Commandant again with my crossbow. That's an 11. Your arrow pierces through his chest, knocking him back and pinning him to a machine. He slumps, lifeless, his last breath leaving his body. All right, and then I want to run to the cubicle area. You can make it there in time for your next turn. All right, George, you're up. I'll attack the bird who hasn't been frightened at all, but I don't have any more boxes of where to mark, so it'll just be a regular engage with melee. That's an eight, thank goodness. You whip your quarterstaff around, cracking it into the side of the bird's head. He falls over with a thud, and the other bird is going to loose an arrow before running away in fear. That is it for my armor, but the birds are dealt with now. Don, you have one more, and Bo, you have two more, right? Yeah, that's right. It's my turn now. Time to kill this guy. Knew it. That's an 11. With a loud roar, you impale the last bird through the chest, breathing hard from the tough fight you just went through. All right, Bo, you're up. All right, guys, I might die here. I'll try to subdue him again. I think that's my only chance, really. Thank goodness that's an 11. All right, you smash the hilt of your weapon into his face and the other starts running away. That was close. Combat is tricky in this. If it was just a bit more difficult, I think there would be a good chance that none of us walked away. That's a bald-faced lie. I would have survived. Sure you would have, Don. All right, I want to head back to Marlo's body to meet up with the others then. We need to talk about Shrubbers too. I'm sorry, I wasn't entirely honest with you. Yeah, I am the son of the Marquis. I was captured by Commandant Stormwing when he realized who I was, and then he was going to try to use me as blackmail to finally kick the Marquisade out of the woodland, or he was going to publicly execute me. Damn, well, it would have been nice to know, but I guess everything turned out okay. Except for Marlo. Poor guy. As you head back to his body, you actually hear him breathing shallowly and raspily. He's alive, the lucky bastard. Let's get him to the hospital then. And then we need to deal with the Marquisat too. And we should probably get out of town before more airy come hunting shrubbers, which means that this will all be up to Marlow when he recovers. Hopefully he can handle it. I have faith in him. All right, let's get to it then. Marlo is in pretty rough shape. I think that's a good place to end the session, actually. You've successfully taken over the factory and repelled an airy assassin squad. We'll leave the rest of the story up to the imagination of the audience. All right, yeah. We all know that either the Marquisat accept our terms or I kill all of them. So there's not really a need to get too much into it. This was fun, Root. The RPG is a pretty cool system and world. There's a lot less combat and more opportunities for social maneuvers. Thanks for having me here too, guys. I had fun and hope that I can join some more adventures with you guys in the future. That sounds like a good plan. Thanks for joining, everyone. If you like the movie, don't forget to like and subscribe and share it with any friends you think might enjoy it. And leave a comment if you want to see more Root the RPG in future videos. We will see you all next time.